today on Living Power. Here's my word of, of hope for today for churches that are failures or are failing. Your church might be a, a dumpster fire, but if your people begin discovering the power of applying the Word of God, it will change their lives and it will change your church. Live for God Studio Productions. This is Living Power with Dan Hurst. Uh, get your, your Bible and your uh, uh, paper and, and pen, and uh, let's get ready to study the Word of God as we continue our study in connecting in a disconnected world. Uh, would you join me for prayer? And let's ask the Lord to really minister to us here this morning. Father, thank you for the privilege that is ours to study your Word and to receive from you instruction and application that we can take and put into our lives that will make our lives better, but also make us more useful in your hands. Lord, this is a, a strange time for all of us. We've never gone through something quite like this before. And uh, we're managing, we're learning, and uh, we're growing. And we trust that you are going to lead us and accomplish what you want to, want to accomplish in our lives. And so thank you for that, Father. Thank you that you're on the throne and we can trust you in times like this. It's in the holy name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Now, we have a number of people visiting us uh, online here from different parts of the United States. It seems to work out this way every week, uh, even from a few other parts of the world. You're welcome. We consider you a, a participant. If you are, are uh, we don't really have members in our class. That's just not the way that we really do things. We have participants. Either you participate or you don't, and that's up to you, and we don't hound you about it. Uh, so you can participate from pretty much anywhere you want to in the world. And we will continue with online studies. We have been doing online studies for years. And uh, we will continue doing online studies even when we start meeting back together as, as a class in our own classroom. So um, <clears throat> welcome. And, uh, and we hope that you'll check in. Feel free to make a, a comment on the chat page. Say hello. Uh, say hello to each other and, and uh, reconnect with each other. Maybe make some new friends. We're studying, uh, the, the title of our study is Connecting in a Disconnected World. Um, and we're looking at ways that we can connect in a disconnected world. Connect with each other, but in connecting with each other, making a difference in the way that we connect with the world. I was struck this past week by an article that I read regarding why and how churches today are, are failing to reach their own communities. You know, it's interesting, my dad used to say all of this, uh, say this all the time, that he, he didn't understand why in a, in a nation like the United States, where it seemed like there was almost a church on every corner, that uh, we were just, it didn't seem to make that big of a difference in, in our nation. And yet uh, there are some countries that people have to walk for miles, uh, maybe even a day, to reach a church uh, to worship in on, on Sunday. And that doesn't seem fair either, does it? But uh, churches today seem, many churches, most churches it seems like, seem like have fallen and failed. And um, while well, I said not all churches are, but most are. Um, and the problem is that there are a lot of churches that are failing and don't know they're failing because they're so active and busy and they equate that with success. And that's what this article was talking about, that just because a church is busy and, and they've got a lot of things going on during the week and a lot of you know, classes going on, then they're doing different things, doesn't mean that that church is, is a success. Community centers do that. Um, this was from a blog by Benjamin Wendell. Listen to this. The big event, the social media campaign, the guest speakers, the giveaways, all the short-term tricks, they may attract an initial crowd. And guess what that crowd will need to keep them happy? All the same things that you promoted to them to reach them in the first place. If you use gimmicks, fads, or hype, you better keep that up every week. If you build a story of your church on being the it church, the cool church, or the image church, be warned that you can't be those things forever. Fads fade away and trends evolve. 
It may seem overly simplistic, but to lead a generation with no biblical background or common knowledge, the church must assume just that, that there exists a, that there exists a fundamental need to provide Bible teaching and basic doctrine. We must lay the foundation. I have uh, been doing a little research on my own over the past few years on why people go to church and why they don't. And I think it's interesting to recognize that we, we sort of assume in church that we know why people don't go to church. And uh, I mean, I've read books on it. I've, you know, I've read several books on it, and, and a lot of them are theories. But um, the interesting thing to me is that churches think that they know why people don't go to church, or they think that they uh, know why people do come to church, and that's what they're going to continue doing. And the fact of the matter is they can get busy and still be failing their community. It's interesting thing. It's an interesting thing to me that um, church leaders and decision makers um, believe that they have to create an environment that is relative to a particular culture. For example, if you want to reach millennials, you have to create a millennial-friendly environment, whatever that is. I guess it means coffee. If you want to reach families, you have to create a kid-friendly environment. And there have been a number of homogenous churches formed through the years, singles churches, uh, country music church, a cowboy church, and so forth and so on. However, in talking to people that don't go to church, one of the things that I, the thing that I've never heard anyone say, in all of the years that I've asked people why they don't go to church, I've never heard people say, I don't go to church because they're not kid friendly, or I don't go to church because they don't get my culture. But what I have heard are three words that keep popping up that indicate what people that don't go to church are looking for. Authenticity, relevancy, and depth. And here's my word of, of hope for today for churches that are failures or are failing. Your church might be a, a dumpster fire, but if your people begin discovering the power of applying the Word of God, it will change their lives and it will change your church. That's what people are looking for. Whether they be churchgoers or, or non-churchgoers, they're looking for authenticity. They want to know that the Word of God is practical and applicable for their lives. They're looking for relevancy. They want to know that the Word of God is relevant to today and the things that they're having to deal with. And they want depth. They want to discover spiritual truth that takes them deep into the meaning and purpose of life. They're tired of shallow, pat-on-the-popo messages that tell them to be good and nice and love everybody, but don't forget to tithe. Listen, cute messages, cute themes, creative performances, slick marketing for a church are substitutions for real ministry. And those things are, 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 are evidence that such a church is not a church, but rather an entertainment venue, an event center. And if that's your church, you'd be better off hanging out at the bowling alley. I mean, you can't fake bowling. At the foundation of that failure of so many churches is the failure to teach the practical, applicable truth of the Word of God. Theatrics, coming up with slick Bible studies, or loud or clever sermons that are still weak and ineffective, are not what people are looking for. The world is looking for authenticity, relevancy, and depth. And that's why it's easier to find a seat in church than it is to find a seat at the bar. Whatever defines church as authentic and relevant and deep is what it does with the Word of God. Let me rephrase that. What defines a church as authentic and relevant and deep is what it does with the Word of God. If God's people take His Word and apply it in their lives, it becomes authentic 
If they discover the practical principles for life, um, for example, everything from finances to relationships to jobs, even to goal setting, if they can find those principles for life and apply them in their life, then it becomes relevant. And if they discover the depths of reality that God has a purpose and a plan for each individual life and what that is and how to apply it in their life, then life has meaning. And that is where you come in. How authentic, how relevant, how deep is your walk with God? Because that's what the world, that's what your circle of influence is looking at and looking for. That's why we're looking at these one another's in the New Testament. These are 10 practical principles that God has given us that define who we are and how real our faith is as we seek to connect with the disconnected world. So far, we've looked at one, uh, one another's of the world. We've looked at love one another. We've looked at be at peace with one another, forgive one another, welcome one another. And today we look at two more as we discover more of what is authentic and relevant and deep that the world is looking for and that we're looking for. Today we look at instruct one another and care for one another. Those are two things <clears throat> that are mentioned in the New Testament that we are to be doing. So let's take a look at these and get started with this first one. Uh, instruct one another. Go to Romans 15, verse 14. Romans 15, verse 14. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. Now, a few years ago, I was talking to a, a middle-aged woman about her church. And uh, listen to what she said. This, this is, I'm quoting her. She said, I like my church because I like the people. They're nice people. I grew up in that church. But honestly, I don't understand half of what the preacher talks about. My whole life I've heard Jesus is coming back, and I wonder why. Frankly, I'm appalled at the lack of sound doctrinal teaching from the pulpits in so many of today's churches. Uh, I'm amazed at how intellectual some preachers can be. They can speak huge words and commanding sentences and compelling thoughts. But when it comes to really sound doctrinal life applications, they're falling apart. And frankly, if it's not coming from the pulpits, it's more than likely not to be happening between the brethren. If sound teaching, applicable teaching, how to, how to take the word of God and apply it to your life, if that's not coming from the pulpit, it's probably not happening in the people of the church. And yet, this is one of the key one another's, instructing one another. We're, it's not even an option. It's a command. We are to instruct one another. Another word for that is discipleship. We are to disciple one another. We're to grow each other in the faith. Now, notice in this verse in Romans that uh, there are two things that must exist for one to be able to instruct one another. First of all, goodness, and the other thing, knowledge. Actually, all knowledge. And what does that mean? First of all, let's look at, at goodness. Goodness means uprightness of heart and life. Uprightness of heart and life. We find goodness to be part of the fruit of the Spirit. It's in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And so we are to have goodness in our lives. And once we have goodness developing in our lives, which happens because the Holy Spirit is working in our lives, once we have Holy Spirit working in our lives, then these things begin to develop in our lives. And the second key word in Romans 15, 14, is that we also are to have knowledge, actually all knowledge. And while 
all knowledge is, is really a good translation. The Greek idea for all knowledge was all necessary knowledge. And specifically, as it's used here, it means all necessary knowledge to instruct someone else. Now, the Corinthian church was a troubled church. Uh, lots of problems, lots of failures, lots of false doctrines. Kind of like a typical church today. Uh, the Apostle Paul wrote a couple of letters to that church, and he stated, uh, or he started his first letter uh, with these words. It's in the very first chapter, 1 Corinthians 1, verses 4 and 5. Look at this. I give thanks to my God always for you, because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge. Now, what Paul was saying and went on to say was that while they were in a mess as a church, they had what they needed to become authentic, relevant, and deep. They had all the necessary knowledge to instruct one another. Now, th this is really, really important to understand because if we, if we think that we've got to go through some special training session of some sort to, to learn how to be uh, authentic and, and learn how to be relevant and, and, uh, and learn how to be deep and, and uh, learn how to apply that in other people's lives. We're going to miss the point. Paul was saying, and he went on to say, that uh, they had what they needed as a church. They had been instructed in these things. Another way of saying this is, um, is understanding what discipleship is. Discipleship. Let's look at the definition of discipleship. Sharing with someone else what you are learning and discovering in Christ. That's what discipleship is. If you're going to disciple someone, all you're going to do is share with them what you're learning and discovering in Christ. It's not like you've reached this level way up here and they're way down here and you're teaching them all things. No, you're sharing what's, what's working in your life. And as you discover it, then you're going to talk about it because it's real and it's meaningful in your life. The Apostle Paul explained it this way to young Timothy. In 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. What Paul was saying to Timothy was, look, you are strengthened by God's grace to share, what, uh, share with others what you've learned. And those people will in turn share with others. Now, I want you to understand something about discipleship. Discipleship isn't um, something, uh, a level that you achieve. I am a discipler. Discipleship is what you do with what the truth that is in your life. And if it is real truth and if it makes a difference in your life, you're going to share it. You're going to connect with other people. When I was in youth ministry about a hundred years ago, uh, I was serving down in, in Florida at the time, and we decided that, uh, that we were going to create disciples and let our disciples create disciples. We wanted that to happen in our, in our youth ministry. And so I, uh, I started working with uh, a number of kids, probably I think at one point there was a dozen uh, young people, and I started discipling them one-on-one, -on -one, just getting into the Word and uh, sharing the things that I was discovering and the, the truth that was real to me and why it was real to me and how it worked in my life and encouraging them to apply that in their life also. And as those kids began to grow and they began to take the Word of God and apply it in their life, then they started sharing that in other people's lives. And one of the interesting things that happened was we started a thing we called Youth Discipleship Missions, where we would take uh, a group of our kids that were discipled, and uh, we'd go to another church for a weekend and let them disciple the young people in that church. And it was always a smaller church. We, we generally picked churches that uh, just that weren't big enough to have like a paid youth minister. And uh, there was a volunteer in the church that was working with youth, and it was a small youth group. And we'd say, how many kids do you have that want to get involved in this weekend? And they'd say, oh, you know, we might have 10 kids or a dozen kids, whatever. Uh, how many boys? How many girls? 
And that's what we would take to the little church for that weekend. Say there were six girls, six boys, we'd take six girls and six boys that had been discipled, and they would disciple one-on-one -on -one for that weekend. A girl would disciple a girl, a guy would disciple a guy. And I would disciple the, the volunteer workers for that weekend. And they would come together on, on uh, Sunday, uh, just, well, we would actually meet together a few times during the week, but our weekend. But finally on Sunday, they would come together and we'd have this one worship service together. And it was magnificent to watch what happened in those young people's lives. The thing that's, that was so amazing to me was these young people who had been discipled couldn't wait to share their faith. They couldn't wait to share the things that they were learning because that's what happens when you, when you discover the truth and the power of the Word of God. You can't wait to share that with other people. And so they started sharing that with other young people. And it was, the stories started coming in about a young person who went back home, a broken home, and, and was able to leave, lead a, a brother or a sister to Christ. Or, or the, the family found a new, new dis, uh, discovered a new way of life in Christ. And, and things began happening in so many of those little churches around Florida. But it started because young people decided to get excited uh, about the truth of God's word and what was happening in their own lives. So discipleship is discovering uh, the, 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 the goodness and the knowledge that God imputes into your life, and it begins by God's grace. Um, see in that verse, it says you, you have this grace in your life. Timothy, you have this, this grace that God has given you. Grace is divine influence in and through your life. God's grace is divine influence in and through your life. And so as God influences your life, you in turn are to influence other lives, and they in turn will influence other lives. That is discipleship. Well, how does that happen? How do you instruct or how do you disciple one another? Do you need a teaching manual? Do you need a set of books, worksheets, you know, homework to give to your disciple? No. You don't. Let's look at a couple of verses that describe exactly how discipleship is done. First of all, look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Colossians 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Colossians 3, 16. Now, Paul says in this verse that there are four things that have to happen for you to instruct one another. The things that happen when you go to, when you begin discipling somebody else, there are four things that need to be real in your life. First of all, the Word of God has to come alive in you. The Word of God has to come alive in you. This is where it begins. You begin to discover the power and the practicality of the Word of God, and it begins to shape your life. But it doesn't mean that you've reached the pinnacle, that you're the perfect Christian. In fact, it means quite the opposite. It means that there are things that God has to do in your life, things that God is up to in your life, things that God is working on in your life. But you are letting him. And the word is making a difference in your life. Every Christian I know has a flawed life. Every Christian I know has a flawed life. Even the ones that God is using have a flawed life. The difference in the ones that God is using is that the Word of God is at work in their lives. So, the first thing is, let the Word of God come alive in your life. Secondly, teach in wisdom. Now, wisdom is the applied knowledge of God. And that's the best way to define it. Wisdom is the applied knowledge of God. You know about God, but whether or not you apply it in your life makes the difference whether it's knowledge or wisdom. So basically, you teach or you instruct or you disciple based on what you are learning to apply in your life. If you apply out of theory, you're lying. You're just playing games and it won't be real in your life because you're implying that you've discovered that and that you're learning it. So that's a lie if it's not being applied in your life. What you are learning to apply in your life is where you teach, what you teach. That's the wisdom, the applied knowledge of God. And it doesn't mean that you have excelled or that you are accomplished. 
uh, in what you're teaching, but rather that you are discovering how to apply it in your life. The third thing is, you are to sing psalms and hymns. Interesting that this is, is in this verse, that Paul included this. Because what he's talking about is worship. Worship is learned. It's taught. In fact, it was so important to learn and teach that God assigned an entire tribe of Israel that did nothing but learn and teach worship. They were called the Levites, the tribe of Levi. In fact, you'll see in, the, in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 8, At that time the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi to carry the ark of the covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister to him, and to bless in his name to this day. That was their job. Their job was to lead worship, to teach worship, and because worship is a fundamental part of life. You, listen, you will worship whatever you serve, and you will serve whatever you truly worship. And as one who instructs another, you teach them by your lifestyle to worship and serve God. Now, I want to point out something really important here. Worship isn't a style. There, we, you know, you see churches advertise this all the time. We have contemporary worship, we have blended worship, we have liturgical worship, and so forth and so on. Worship isn't a style. People confuse worship expression with worship experience. Uh, and, and you see this in church all the time. People say, oh man, that worship was awesome. That choir was awesome. That singer was awesome. That, that preacher was really, really good. They are commenting on their expression, the way they express themselves. And worship isn't about expression. It is an experience. Here's the best definition I know of worship, because I made it up. Here's, <laughs> here's the best definition of worship. The absolute surrender to the holiness of God and all the demands that makes on my life. The absolute surrender to the holiness of God and all the demands that makes on my life. So listen, if you go to church and you go to a corporate worship experience that lasts an hour, an hour and 15 minutes, and you're just thrilled about the experience, but it hasn't changed your life, you haven't discovered and yielded to the, to the holiness of God and all the demands that makes on your life, you haven't worshiped. You may have, ex you may have gone through an experience uh, or an expression of worship and you may have seen people express worship and thought that was really cool. But worship is an experience of the absolute surrender to the holiness of God and all the demands that makes on your life. That's worship. And when that happens, it affects the rest of the week. The corporate worship will affect your worship during the week. And you will find yourself during the week surrendering to the holiness of God and all the demands that makes on your life. That's worship. It becomes a lifestyle. So when you wake up on Monday morning, you realize that you are going to surrender to the holiness of God and all the demands that makes on your life. You're worshiping. Then on Wednesday, sometime on Wednesday, you go to a, a, an office meeting and it's just as boring as it can be and people make all kinds of complaints or maybe even accuse you of doing some things that, that you didn't do and it's, it's frustrating and it's angering. And you get along with God and you realize that you need to surrender to the holiness of God and all the demands that makes on your life. That's worship. See, worship is a lifestyle. It is an experience that starts and dis when the, with the discovery of the holiness of God and the demands that makes on your life. And when that happens, then you begin to teach worship that way. When you begin worshiping that way, you will disciple others to worship that way. The fourth thing that has to happen to be a disciple or to be one that instructs another is to be thankful. That's what Paul says. Be thankful. Thankfulness, here's the definition that I know for thankfulness. Thankfulness is the acknowledgement that God is your source and resource. Thankfulness is the acknowledgement that God is your source and resource. Now the difference between praise and thankfulness is that praise acknowledges who God is Thankfulness acknowledges what God does for us. Praise uh, acknowledges God for who he is. Thankfulness acknowledges God for what he does. Now, 
Thankfulness, then, acknowledges that God is up to something in your life. He's doing something in your life, and for that you can be thankful. It doesn't mean you can be th that you're thankful that, oh, you know, I got hit by a bus. You know, I'm so thankful. No. Thankful is recognizing that God is doing something in your life. And when you believe that, when you know that God is up to something in your life, you will also believe and know that God is up to something in the person's life that you are instructing. And one more verse about how to instruct one another. 1 Thessalonians 5.14. 1 Thessalonians 5.14. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. I underline that because I want you to get that. All of them, all of the people in your life that, that, that God puts in your life that, are, that claim to be Christians, but they're idle or, or they're, they're faint-hearted or they're weak, weak spiritually, be patient with them. 1 Thessalonians 5.14. Now, this is really important to understand. The people that God puts into your life the people that God puts into your life to instruct, to disciple, are learning and growing. They make mistakes. They fail. They don't understand certain things in the scriptures. They fall down. It's your job as you instruct and disciple them to admonish. That doesn't mean that you castigate them. That means that you would point out where things need to be, be corrected. You admonish, you encourage, you help, and you need to be patient. Which brings us to the seventh uh, one another of the New Testament, and that is to care for one another. Care for one another. Um, I love this passage that, that, that talks about this caring for one another. It's, um, it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 21 through 25. Remember, I told you Corinthians was a troubled church. It was a mess. And it's interesting that this, this is in Corinthians, that Paul uses this as one, as, uh, one of the one another's that churches need to, to really, really take to heart and apply in their lives. Look at this. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the hand, head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker, weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. Now, the word care is the same word for anxious. It's the exact same word. And depending on the context of the word as it's used in the Bible, it means different things. Essentially, there is a negative connotation and there is a positive connotation. And here in this passage, we see the positive connotation used, where care is used to mean compassion and concern with the intent to benefit another. Care is, the idea is that it is, um, that it is used or it is expressed with compassion and concern with the intent to benefit another. But that sort of care is predicated on what Paul says previous to verse 25. In verses 21 through 24, Paul illustrates the powerful truth of body life. He just basically says, okay, this, compare your body. There are parts of your body, you know, that, that uh, do certain things. They don't all do the same thing. And one isn't any more important than the other. When we say body life um, as the body of Christ, uh, the church, then we begin to see the, that all of us are necessary parts of the body. And that's what Paul was doing. He was saying, just as there are different parts in your body, there are different parts in the body of Christ, the church. And they're all necessary. They're all part of what makes the church function. And so when we understand that, 
when we as the body of Christ, the church, begin to see each other as necessary parts of the body, it changes our whole perspective. Suddenly, that person there is not less valuable. And that person over there isn't more important than that person over here. And when that person sitting right there is hurting or discouraged or lonely or struggling, you begin to realize that those discouragements and difficulties in some way affect all of us. And so you need to share some genuine love and compassion and concern with the intent to benefit that person. That's caring for one another. Because by doing that, not only do you bless that person, but you bless all of us. We all benefit from that. Everybody in the body of Christ benefits when, when one is encouraged and blessed and cared for. The letter to the Ephesians says it this way. It's in Ephesians uh, chapter 5, starting with verse 18. Look at this. Be filled with the Spirit addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, I love this word, submitting. It's so, it's so misused so many times. You know, we think of submitting like the, the, the husband telling the wife, because the Bible says wives submit to your, to your husbands. What they miss is that earlier in that passage, it says the men are to submit to the wives too. It says we're to submit to one another. So if my wife is sub supposed to submit to me, I'm also submit to her because she's a believer in Christ and I, I have that responsibility. So what does that mean to submit? Does that mean you do what that person tells you to do? No, it doesn't mean that. Here's the definition of submission. To have another's best interests at heart. To have another person's best interests at heart. That's what submission means. It's the idea that I really do want what's best for you. And I want to make that happen. Um, I love what Philippians 2 verses 3 and 4 says. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but to the interests of others. Submit. Have their best interests at heart. And then Romans 12, verses 9 and 10 says this. Let love be genuine. Let love be genuine. Don't fake it. Remember, love is allowing God to do something in someone else's life through you. That's how we define it. That's the application of the word love, agape love, allowing God to do something in someone else's life through you. So let your love be genuine. Let God actually do something in somebody else's life through you. Don't fake it. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. You might say that would be exhausting. Oh man, the idea that I got to go do all of that to everybody, you know, in the in the body, and I gotta I gotta be doing things for them, and man, I'm gonna burn out so quickly. Yeah, yeah, you would if you were the Lone Ranger. If you're practicing Lone Ranger Christian, where you're the only one doing it, yeah, you are gonna burn out. But what if you were surrounded by other brothers and sisters practicing the very same thing? What if you were part of a body of believers who all believed that and were practicing that? In his book, The One Another Project, which was kind of the basis that kind of launched this study that we're doing, it's a book by uh, Wayne Hoeg. Uh, Wayne gives this, this little illustration. When we start talking about this type of sacrificial living, our flesh shudders because the devil has convinced us or tried to convince us that such an arrangement is filled with loss. But I want to tell you that according to the word of God, we will experience only gain. If you were in a room with 100 people and they were all intent on esteeming others as more important than themselves, the return of being in the room would be 99 to 1. 
If you're in a room with 100 people bent on loving one another as Christ loved his church, you'll get back 99 times more than you give out. Care for one another. I just think that that's a, a, a magical component, and yet it's not magical, it's of the Lord. But it's a powerful component of what the world sees that a church should be doing. And if they don't see it happening, then they know we're living a lie. And it's important to understand that it's not just lip service. It's not just caring about one another. It's caring for one another. Two completely different things. How have you been caring for other brothers and sisters in Christ? How have you been making a difference in their lives? Discover how valuable each other is within the body of Christ. And I want you to know something. As we meet together as a class, whether it's online or, or whether it's in a building, we have a responsibility to care for one another. The people that are studying with you right now online, they need you to pray for them. They need you to care for them. The people that are in this group right now, studying with us right now, need to know that God has a word for them. Would you pray for them right now? Would you ask God to work in their life? I mean, literally, pray for people in this group right now. There are some that you don't even know that are, are participating. We're on two different Facebook channels and on a phone conference, so there are people that you don't know that are participating. But pray for them. Because their need, they have needs. There are things happening in their life that we don't even know about. But we need to care, not just about them, but care for them. And then as God opens up opportunities, and he'll make it clear when he wants you to do something, as God opens up opportunities for you to make a difference in someone's life, do it. Do it. Care for one another. And as we do that, we will discover, and the world will discover, and the world will see authenticity, relevance, and depth. Let's pray. Father, I pray now that you would give us the, the word, your word, and apply it in our lives in such a way that we discover this powerful truth. Our responsibility to, responsibility to instruct one another, to discipleship each other, to disciple each other and, and grow each other spiritually, and then to literally care for, not just about, but to care for each other. Father, build that as a passion in our lives to become what you have called us to be and desired us to be. Take these words, Father, from, from your scriptures and apply them in our lives and make them real this week, I pray. In the holy and precious name of Jesus, amen. Next week, it's an interesting follow-up to this study. Next week, the care or the, uh, the serve one another that we'll be looking, or the, the one another that we'll be looking at is serving. How do you serve one another? How, what's that all about? How do you really how do you really serve one another? What are the practical implications of serving? We'll take a look at that next week. I hope you'll plan on joining us next week. Uh, feel free to leave comments in the in the uh, in the comment area there. Uh, if if you're not don't have access to that, you can always send us an email at info at theopenclass.com. Info at theopenclass.com and uh, we'd love to hear from you we'd love to wherever you are in the world um, and tell us about your life tell us what are, what's going on what can we pray for you about how can we pray for you what what do you need prayer about let us know because there are people in our in our group that will pray for you they want to encourage you and uh, even if you don't know that they're praying for you uh, they'll be praying for you and they'll be lifting you up before the Lord. So let us know about that. And uh, join us again next week as we talk about serving one another. Until next week, go away. God bless you. And uh, have a great week. On behalf of Dan Hurst and the Open Class, we want to thank you for watching. We hope it was a blessing.